brothers and sisters in Christ, suppose that I was going to let you pick someone through whom you could change the world. Who would you choose? Any, any type of person through whom you could change everything. Would you maybe try to use the influence of a famous singer, someone like Adele? Would you try to produce a movie or, or a documentary and use some famous actor like Will Smith, someone well-known? Would you try to research some new type of device or a new way of thinking from a, a famous scientist like Stephen Hawking? Or maybe you would try to think of a new business plan, a, 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 new, a new way of conducting yourself in the world, like, like Mark Zuckerberg, the founder of Facebook. Or another famous businessman, known in his English name by Jack Ma. There are many people that we could think of, and I, I don't know who you would choose to change the world. But what I'm guessing is that you would not have done what God did, that you would not have chosen the Virgin Mary to change the world. Last week, we started to talk about where God chose to change the world from. In the season of Advent, preparing for Jesus' birth, we saw that God prepared to change the world through this place called Galilee in the back corner of the Roman Empire and this town called Nazareth. And the name was so synonymous with no good that no one had probably even heard of it outside of the immediate area. And God didn't even choose someone who was mildly successful or, or, or someone who was maybe the leader of a local community or even someone who was the head of their family. But God chose Mary, someone who was likely in her teenage years, maybe like any other girl who would be in our youth group. God chose Mary to change the world. As, as we sung about a little bit ago and heard last week, Mary was told a very special message by the angel Gabriel. The angel Gabriel came to Mary and told her that she was highly favored. What was it that she was highly favored? Well, Mary was highly favored because she was going to give birth to a son. And as we know, this son wasn't just going to be any son, but he was going to be the fulfillment of prophecies like Micah that we heard. He was going to be the royal Messiah, this, this king from, from David's line. As Christians, we even know that he was God himself in the flesh. Something amazing to even ponder. Maybe at this point when Mary heard these words, she knew that she was going to be one of the most famous women, let alone famous people of all time. She was going to give birth to the Messiah, to God himself. Now granted, I'm not a woman, but if I was told that my son was going to be the fulfillment of prophecy, he was going to be the savior of the world. He was going to complete God's plan of salvation that prophets for thousands of years had talked about. I might get at least a little proud, right? I might think, you know, of course God chose me. I, I'm so faithful attending worship, you know. I've done so many good deeds. Or I, I, I must be just a, such a fantastic parent to be that God would choose me to raise this child. We can think of a whole host of reasons. But think about this. What did Mary do? When Mary was told who her son was going to be, 
How did she respond? She responded with our gospel for today. She responded with what are traditionally called the words of the Magnificat. Magnificat is a word that means glorifies. It's the first word of this song in Latin. And Mary expresses her joy, not by glorifying herself, but the exact opposite, glorifying God. Let's, let's meditate on the beginning of Mary's words when she was told who her son was going to be. Sorry, we can skip to the next slide. We start out in here. My soul glorifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. For he has been mindful of the humble state of his servant. From now on, all generations will call me blessed. For the mighty one has done great things for me. Holy is his name. His mercy extends to those who fear him from generation to generation. I'd like you to, to meditate on these words for a minute with me. Notice what Mary does. She doesn't say, yes, Lord, thank you that I'm not like these other parents. She doesn't say, thank you for recognizing all the talent that, that, that I had ready for me. Instead, she points it back and she says, my soul glorifies the Lord and rejoices in God, my Savior. And see what the reason is. For he has been mindful of the humble state of his servant. A few things. Mary lived in a humble state. Now, Mary lived in a humble state, as a lowly state, not, not just because she was over in Nazareth and, and not just because she was in the, the poor class at this time. But Mary was born into a world like you and me. She was born into a world of suffering and death. She was born into a world needing a savior. Mary was born knowing that God had been working in ways that she could not understand, working things out so that a savior would come. And now she knew that the savior was going to come through her. Mary said that the mighty one has done great things for me Holy is his name. His mercy extends to those who fear him from generation to generation. Mary knew that God had done mighty acts from generation to generation throughout history and that these things were finally going to come to fruition through her. And notice what she calls Jesus at the beginning of this. She says that my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. Mary needed a savior like anyone. And Mary rejoiced that God was going to give her her savior. And not just a savior, not a savior for one group of people or a savior for good people or a savior for people who go to this or that synagogue, but a savior for all people. The angel Gabriel gave her this news. And you know what? God has given us his news. It's called the gospel. God has promised that he is also our savior. When we are baptized into his name, God makes an unconditional promise to us that just as Jesus was beloved by God and perfect and sinless, that we too are perfect and sinless and beloved by God. When we participate with each other and, 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 and eat the Lord's Supper, one by one, Jesus promises that I am your savior. Here is your forgiveness. Here is your forgiveness. That we too, like Mary, can rejoice in God, our Savior. There's no room for doubt. Ma Mary, Mary's thoughts here of recalling what God has done, not what she has done, but God's mighty acts. It's in line with maybe one of our favorite verses at, in, our, in our Lutheran church, let alone at Savior of the Nations, with what Paul tells us in his letter to the Ephesians. He tells us concerning our salvation that it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this not from yourselves, it is a gift of God, not by works so that no one can boast. 
as I was saying with the children, when we receive presents, that's a gift and that it's something that's undeserved. I doubt that any of us who, who have children would say one Christmas year, you know, one birthday, eh, maybe I'll give you a gift, but maybe this year I'm not going to give you one. You haven't really been that good. That's more like the public Christmas myth. God had promised to give Mary a son, regardless of what she had done. Jesus promises to be our Savior as a gift. A gift that we're looking forward to the beginning of this, this year at Christmas. Pure joy are, are her words. Let's look here at the second half of, of what Mary said. As she continues this theme of what God has done. Mary says, He has performed mighty deeds with his arm. He has scattered those who are proud in their inmost thoughts. He has brought down rulers from their thrones, but has lifted up the humble. He has filled the hungry with good things, but has sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel, remembering to be merciful to Abraham and his descendants forever, just as he promised to our ancestors. Now, something we see here is that Mary knew her Bible. Mary had grown up listening to the scriptures, hearing them read. And you, 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 you can just see her knowledge as she remembers what God has done to lift up the humble and to take down the proud. Mary had known how God took a, a, an, an idolater, someone named Abram, out of that type of lifestyle and promised to him and his descendants that a savior would come. A, a seed, he calls it. And through this seed, all the nations of the world are going to be blessed. Not just Mary, but, but, but everyone. Mary talks about God scattering the proud. Mary grew up knowing the story of the Israelites in slavery in Egypt, of how they were hungry and there was Pharaoh with his proud heart, and how God had scattered them with, with mighty acts, as she says sending the Israelites away with good things on their way to the promised land and leaving those Egyptians empty. And talking of rulers, you know, tearing down their thrones, Mary knew the stories of how God had taken the Babylonians, these people who had, who had destroyed Solomon's temple and had sent the Jews away, how God tore them down from their thrones with the Persians and with the Persians tore them down with the Greeks, and the Greeks tore them down from their thrones with, with the Romans. The point is, God has a history of tearing down the proud and raising up the humble, raising up his people. God is the one who is in control of salvation. And just as Mary ended her song, just as he promised to her ancestors, God is faithful, and when he makes a promise, that promise comes. Just as the promise to send the Savior came on that, that first Christmas day, through the Virgin Mary. Brothers and sisters in our Lord, let's remember that God has a history of raising up the humble and giving good things. For us who confess our sins, who humble ourselves before God, God feeds us with good things. For us who have been baptized, God has a promised land waiting for us. God has a heavenly reward sitting there waiting for us one day, just as God promised he would send his son. For us who are part of his humble people, we have peace. We don't need to wonder whether or not God does love us. We, we don't need to look for other purposes in life. We don't need to worry about these things because God has promised that he does love us and that he is with us. And in this Advent season, as we get forward to Christmas, let's, like Mary, be thankful for the gifts that God has given us. Let's be thankful for our family, for the sons and daughters that he may have blessed us with, for the, for the time that we have to gather together. And let's thank God that he did send Jesus after all this time, Jesus to be our Savior. And let's thank God for the gift of faith that he has given us through his word as Jesus comes to us every Sunday, as we confess our sins, as we read about him in his word. Let's always rejoice with Mary 
at the birth of that son. Amen.